Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dave Nicholas. I am a member of the EMLA office. I work with uh, Lee and Mike, and of course, Ms. Gellis, uh, who's uh, been so kind to join us out west uh, this summer. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, so um, I'm the manager of a group called the Legacy Waste, uh, Legacy Waste Group. Um, so again, I'm on, on the EM side of the house. Um, I came back to Los Alamos in uh, 2008, the fall of 2008, and um, lived there in Los Alamos with, uh, with my wife and two kids. So I got one Hilltopper graduated and one in the works. And um, my recollections of the Sagebrush Inn were from, I lived two different times in Taos, New Mexico. So my dad was a forester, um, came from the Midwest, came out west, worked in uh, Cuba, New Mexico, and, uh, all, and he fell in love with this area. So I was very fortunate to, uh, uh, like I spent, spent two different occasions in Taos, New Mexico, and, it's, and uh, actually started, uh, started my, uh, my academic uh, career, I would guess call it, in uh, Penasco. So I went to St. Anthony's, uh, which uh, unfortunately is uh, no longer um, being run, but uh, but anyway, um, so um, so my recollections of the Sagebrush Inn were as it was a sagebrush flat. I don't know if my recollections are correct. Maybe Manise can calibrate me, but I just remember this being the edge of town, right? I mean, the Sagebrush Inn was the end of town, and clear sagebrush flat out there. Um, maybe my recollections are correct, but I also remember my my walk to Penasco, uh, to St. Anthony's, seemed like a mile, and I went back there, kind of did one of those routes where you go back and look at some of the, the places you used to, used to live, and it was no more than 100 feet. I think you could throw a rock from the, from the house to, uh, to the school. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here, uh, here in Taos today, um, and I um, hope everybody's had a great summer. It's been a great summer for me um, with, the, with the rain and the, and the water. Um, I've driven the road. I was telling Randy and I drove up the canyon together. And I was pointing out all the spots in the river. Um, um, so I've got to, to know the, at least part of the Rio Grande much better this summer with, uh, with my son. We've spent a lot of great time on the river. But um, I wish I was here to talk to you about the river, but um, instead I'm going to talk to you about uh, a legacy waste program and, and, and kind of the status of true waste up, at, up in Los Alamos. Maybe. <laughs> Where's Uptown Funk when you need it? <laughs> We'll just, there hey, there we go. Contrary. Got it back, all right. Thank you, Will. Much appreciated. So again, this is the aerial of Area G. Um, I'm gonna talk about our legacy uh, true waste priorities, where we're at. Um, talk to you a little bit about a, a project that we've been working most of the summer. Um, actually, we started it, uh, um, late in the spring, um, talk about supplemental cooling um, and what that is all about. Um, I'm going to go back to the AIB report. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but I'll tell you where we're at with our corrective action plans that we've been working. Um, talk to you a little bit about the WIP settlement. I think most of that is um, 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 been out and about, but I'll touch on that and I'll just give a quick update on our transition process and where we're at. Um, so in terms of our, our priorities, our number one priority is the continued safe storage of the nitrate salt uh, population up in, uh, that we have up in Los Alamos. I think some of you, some of the CAB members at least, have had the opportunity to get out to Area G and actually physically look at the storage configuration. Um, and I'll talk some more about that. Um, then we want to get on with um, reprocessing that, uh, that um, nitrate salt waste uh, that we have to put it in a more inherently safe con um, chemical configuration than it is currently in. 
and then get back on our feet, get back to uh, reprocessing and repackaging and the job at hand. Um, as Carlos mentioned, we have uh, we never finished our 3706 campaign, so of course we have uh, we have waste, uh, legacy waste, still on the hill that uh, that ultimately needs to be um, readied uh, to to go to WIP. So this is our current storage configuration of the of the nitrate salts. Um, we have them all consolidated into one of our old box lines. So this is in in dome 375. Uh, we call it a Permacon. Permacon is, is basically a, a brand name, but it's that, um, that radiologically con controlled structure. And like I said, it was built, it was built with the intended purpose of, of handling uh, radioactive materials. So um, some of our old pictures have guys in full PPE inside of this Permacon, um, decontaminating, and in some cases, size reducing very large oversized contaminated uh, glove boxes and pieces of equipment. So that's what the, the facility was designed for um, when um, it, um, the issue um, came to light with, with the nitrate salts. Um, we, we turned it into a storage, uh, storage configuration. So we have all the salts, um, like I said, in that permacon. So what you see here are standard waste boxes and that's a, um, one of the typical configurations that's used to, to go down into the, into the whip mine. Um, the actual salts themselves, which you cannot see, they're um, inside of a 55-gallon drum. So inside of these standard waste boxes um, um, is actually the drum that contains the, the nitrate salt. So basically what you're seeing is an overpack. So we've layered, um, you know, layered some controls in place um, if we were to uh, have an event similar to the, uh, the event that occurred in WIP, you would have some layers of protection, and that's the purpose of that standard waste box. And then on top of that, you have, um, you have the Permacon, which is a, like I said, it's a radiologically controlled structure. Um, it's, it's climate controlled, and I'll talk a little bit about that because I'm going to talk about a, a, a supplemental cooling um, um, project that we've embarked on this summer and why, uh, talk a little bit about why um, temperature is important with this, with this waste. Um, Dane, question. Sure. The standard waste boxes, do you expect to ship those just as, as they're packed once SWIP opens? So with these, think, or, with or this actual be... configuration, we're going to have to go in, take the waste out of the standard waste box, take the drum to a facility where we can then reprocess the waste. So none of these, as they're currently packaged, will go to WIP. Now, um, I will say we've got a little bit of a, of a mishmash, if you will, in that storage configuration. And what I mean by that is we had some nitrate salts that were ready to go to WCS um, and ready to go to WIP before we became obviously knowledgeable of, of our mistakes that we made when we processed that. So um, in a couple of these, uh, um, it's 11, maybe 11 or 12 of these standard waste boxes, we've got, I call it companion waste that was packaged in with them. So we're going to, um, when we get ready um, to do that processing, we're going to have to segregate that waste. That waste may be okay to go because uh, it's in a different waste stream, different type of waste. Um, um, but, but the bottom line is, as it sits right now, each one of those is going to have to be opened up and um, the waste will, will be reprocessed to, uh, to eliminate the, uh, um, obviously, the, um, the chemical combination and, and make, the, uh, uh, make the drum inert, and the waste, excuse me, the waste inert. So that's our, that's our, current, um, our current picture of our current storage configuration. Now, I, I mentioned uh, a little bit about one of the, one of the um, reasons we chose um, 375. Obviously, it was, it was an existing facility. Um, it was built to contain radioactive materials, so it's got high-efficiency particulate air filters. Um, so any air that comes into the facility gets exhausted out of the facility. It's kept at a negative pressure. So um, air is always going into into the Permacon and then out through, a, through an exhaust train, through a heap of filters. Um, early on, um, the chemists at, at the laboratory 
um, as soon as it was identified, like as soon as it was identified that it was a, uh, a drum from Los Alamos, um, well, obviously it was a bad day, um, um, but I would say one of the good things, if you want to look at it, um, is we had a lot of resources. I, when I say we, I mean the, lab, the broader laboratory to throw at the problem. And so um, um, I would say one of the, the positive aspects of my job in the last, uh, over the last, say, 15, 18 months since this event is I've got to work with some super top-notch scientists. And, um, and they dive into this problem right away to try to seek to understand what's going on, what, what could, have, could have happened. Um, and, and you've heard some of that from, the, um, from um, Ted Weika and the AIB, and if you've uh, looked at all at the uh, uh, technical assessment team, you know, we came to the conclusion that it was the incompatible materials that were in the drum. It was um, the addition of the organic absorbent or the sweet um, kitty litter with, uh, with an oxidizer, uh, with, the, with the nitrate salts. Um, and so you had, a, you had a chemical reaction that occurred within the drum, um, and uh, obviously we want to prevent that in these drums. Um, so, so in the current isolation plan, um, you know, one of the first things out of the gate, uh, state of New Mexico um, issued an administrative order requiring that we put together an isolation plan and how we were going to isolate and protect this waste. And within that isolation plan, it, uh, we submitted that one of the controls is to keep, keep the waste as cold as is practical. And so, um, so one of the upsides to the Permacon, and one of the reasons why the Permacon was chosen, um, in addition to the fact that it's built to contain um, um, contamination and radioactive materials, is it also had a, a heating and cooling system on it. Um, and so we've tried to, we've, we have maintained uh, this waste as cool as practically uh, and uh, through the summer. So it's a, it's a cool system. And I'm going to talk about a supplemental cooling. Dave? Yes. Do these waste containers or any of them have the same ingredients as the one that uh, uh, leaked down in whip? So I'm going to say yes and no. <laughs> so let me explain that. So the reason I'm going to say no is if they were the same as the, if they were the exact same as that drum and whip, I would have um, about 60 of these that would have went off, that would have reacted, that would have had the chemical reaction. So they came from the same waste stream, um, and so I'm going to go back a little bit um, what the waste stream is. Um, so for years, um, I came into the business in the late 80s, um, way before I got here. Um, um, chemists and chemical engineers have been uh, recovering plutonium. So we recycled plutonium before it was ever in vogue. Uh, before recycling was ever in vogue, that material was so needed by the nation to, um, um, we could get philosophical about the nuclear deterrent, but we were, we were building a lot of weapons. And so, um, so we used nitrate. Nitrate chemistry was the was the um, I would say the mainstay. Not only at, at Los Alamos, I started my career up at Rocky Flats, and um, use use nitric acid to recover the plutonium. So anyway, the waste stream is. You asked the question. Is it the same? Um, so I'm going to say no. It's not. It's not. It's not the same. But it um, has a lot of the similar characteristics in that we know that those salts are an oxidizer, and so they have. Um, the potential to, dr to drive chemical reactions, and they will want to oxidize um, uh, materials that they become in contact with. So um, when we added the organic, inadvertently added the organic absorbent, we set up a situation where um, we essentially promoted that, that, chemi that chemical reaction. So we know some of those, I would say, similar chemical reactions are occurring within these drums, but at very, very, very low um, uh, rates. Um, so, so I'd say, no, they're not the same. If they were the same, uh, we would have uh, a much different conversation today. Um, um, so we don't believe they're the same. 
but, uh, but they, do, they do present a hazard that, uh, that we need to address and, and ultimately, like I said, uh, treat these drums so that, uh, uh, so that uh, we eliminate that risk. Did I, did I get your question? So, um, so anyway, these are pictures of, um, we've got a couple pictures here. We've got guys putting in a supplemental cooling system and uh, you got a little CAD, CAD drawing. Um, and so this is, um, we realize that, um, that we're not going to immediately be able to go and reprocess this material. So unfortunately, um, uh, we're going to be sitting on this for, for a little bit of time. And, um, and so um, we're, we're adding a, a, a secondary cooling system to, um, for a couple reasons. One is it'll, it'll allow us to um, keep the system cool. It'll provide us a level of redundancy. Um, uh, like I said, the current system does have climate controls, but um, we actually experienced a failure on one of the, on one of the units this summer and um, it would be nice to have a redundant system. So um, this, we've been working on this most of the summer. This is uh, gonna be essentially um, tested and, and put into operation this week. Um, so that's a, that's a look of the unit. And basically it provides us with an added layer of, of, of insurance. We wanna make absolutely sure um, that we don't have a similar reaction like we saw at WIP. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that the waste is kept cool. <clears throat> um, and, so, and so that's what we're doing. And I'm going to try to impress you with a uh, little chemistry. So I'm not going to try to teach a chemistry class. That's not the intent here. But just to go into a little more detail, why is, so we talk about temperature. And like I said, the lab scientists knew early on, hey, um, while we're trying to figure out um, all the details and do some of this, this chemistry, um, it'd be a good idea to get this waste uh, as cold as you can. Um, in the winter, that's pretty easy. Um, just push air through that, that permacon. It comes in uh, courtesy, uh, courtesy of Mother Nature, very cold. Um, and so, anyway, um, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, it was my many, many years ago when uh, I was a lot smarter than I am now. But uh, one of the things that stuck in my brain, so I had a, a, a teacher who talked about thermodynamics and kinetics, and what does that mean? Try to make it real simple for you. So um, my professor would say, thermodynamics tells you if something's gonna happen, and kinetics tells you how fast it's gonna happen. So as an example, if I got a, if I got a nail, right? I know that nail's gonna rust. If it's in, the, if it's in, in our atmosphere, oxygen is gonna rust. But that's in a slow process, right? So how do you slow down? So we know we're having very, um, I would say, minor chemical reactions in a lot of these drums. Um, the oxidizers are oxidizing some of those chybohydrates, that uh, organic material that was added. Um, and so uh, this is just a little chart. And, and again, I practice, I practice thermodynamics and kinetics um, I've got a bought, a, bought a, bought a neat house up in Los Alamos. One of the features, it's got a Kiva fireplace, right? And so um, I've, I oxidized this ponderosa pine um, um, that, I, that I got sitting under my deck. I put it in there. And um, part of the trick is to, get, is to get over that little energy hump to get that fire going, right? Um, and so I do that, obviously, by introducing some energy. and. I get I get oxidation. I get um, I get all that um, all that fine wood to, to burn and uh, uh, makes for a cozy evening. So anyway, the point of the cooling, getting back to the, the true waste, the point of the cooling is to slow those reactions down um, as much as we can to ensure that uh, ensure that we we keep the material safe. Uh, so that's the point of uh, spending almost a million dollars, quite frankly, on that supplemental cooling system is to, um, if we have a, a issue with our primary cooling system, um, it gives us some redundancy and uh, gives us the ability to, um, to even cool that waste further. And we're not seeing anything, um, 
This isn't a reaction to anything. This is, we call it defense in depth. Um, and that was on the previous slide. And that's just the term of art that we use um, in our business. It's just another layer of protection, right? We want as many layers of protection um, while, we, um, while we watch and, and store this waste until we're ready to, uh, to, ready to start treating it. Can I ask a question real quick, please? Yes. When you talk about the cooling system, is, and you're talking about minimal reaction that might be happening now, is there a chance then that when it's not in this cooling system, you're going to have a different reaction? As, you know, is there a chance, for example, when it is transferred out or if, when it, I'm assuming it's not going to stay there forever in that cooling system. So would that ever make a difference that it could happen, like the drum at WIP? We don't believe so. Um, um, and, and one of our precursors to treatment that we've been talking about is actually to keep the waste cold through processing. Um, so we may wind up doing that and enhancing that um, even uh, to cool the waste additionally. So we think it's a prudent, uh, very prudent step in terms of, of, of preventing. Um, we, don't, um, we don't believe based on what we've seen from the waste um, that we are going to, even at higher temperatures, we'd have a, we'd have a, a problem, a reaction. And we've actually inadvertently tested that um, with, with the waste at, at WCS. So WCS has a little over 100 uh, uh, of the nitrate salt drums that were prepared in the same way as the waste we have at Los Alamos and of the waste that is in room seven, panel seven. And um, again, in response to the event, uh, WCS and, and, and Lee's talked about this, they, they took a similar approach um, in, in, in adding a layer of, of confinement. So they put the, uh, they put the waste, um, so you had, they had the same configuration there. They had a drum inside a standard waste box with some other waste, and then they put those into these modular concrete containers. Well, those are interesting. Apparently those come in one color, kind of like the old, uh, the old was it Ford Model Ts. Uh, they come in black. And um, they're large. They're, if you've seen them, they're quite large. And so um, they took them outside of their container storage building, and they were sitting out in June in, um, unfortunately, in the West Texas sun. And um, um, so they got, they got quite warm. So again, same type of waste stream that we have. Um, they got, um, uh, like I said, unfortunately, uh, quite warm. Uh, before they put them into their, into their uh, uh, federal waste cell. And that was one of the reasons uh, for putting them in that cell was to cool them off. Um, so they kind of got a basement effect, I call it, um, when, they, um, when they put them in the cell. And then a couple things, right? It provides another layer of protection. So you got the sand then also on top of the, uh, the MCC. It's in a facility that's designed to dispose of um, um, radioactive waste, and um, and it also um, was it was was their way of cooling it. There was another question? Yeah, go ahead. What is the timeline to reprocess the waste in these standard boxes? Yeah, I'm going to um, talk about that here in a minute. So the the timeline right now is, as you know, um, we're in the process of trying to negotiate a, a bridge contract. Uh, with lands, and um, the, the timeline for that calls to, uh, to process the waste in fiscal year 17. Um, so we're looking, we're looking out at, at least a year of preps and then uh, looking at, at, at trying to execute that in fiscal year 17. And we would very much, um, we've pushed, um, I've pushed um, and I had, have had great support. Um, to, um, to, to keep that in the scope of the bridge contract and to, um, um, we have all the, all the proper technical resources um, at the lab to do that. Um, like I said, I think, I believe we understand these nitrate salts better than, than anyone at this point, um, given the amount of time uh, that we've taken to, to look at them. So, so the, the answer to your question is, we're looking at doing it in 17. Why does it take Thank so you. long? 
two years from now, and that's a year and a half since the original incident. We're talking three to four years after the original incident to get, I gather, get started on reprocessing this waste. And you've understood what the problem was for a long time. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why this is taking so long, given that your level of knowledge of what caused the problem seems to be pretty well developed. Great question, and um, um, the short answer is we still have work to do. Um, we, I would say we have a, a notion of how we want to do it. Um, we only want to do it once. We want to make sure that, um, that um, it's a high level of review, independent review, in addition to just um, Los Alamos. Um, I would say right now we suffer from a little bit of a, a little bit of a credibility gap with uh, with respect to um, um, some external entities that are looking at what we're doing. Um, so we still have work to do. I'm going to talk about that a little bit right now. In fact, that's that's maybe not a bad segue into this cartoon. Wait, um, Nona, you had a question that you want to ask of Jeff. Yeah, so uh, several months ago, sort of early on in the investigation, uh, we had a presentation where somebody stated that the drum that breached um, had a, quote, very unique, unquote, um, combination of chemical constituents in it, in particular a certain glove along with the nitrates and everything else and the organic materials. So um, are you now saying that that drum wasn't in any significant way so different as other um, drums or packages of any kind of the similar nitrate salt containing waste. And that, so these are more similar than was presented earlier to the, the drum that did have a reaction. So certainly I believe something was unique about 68660. Um, like I said, if they were all the same, if they were, um, you know, fundamentally, uh, we would have the same reaction in every drum that we have, and we haven't seen that. Um, now, I, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had a very crisp answer and understanding as to what was so unique about 68660. Um, you know, we've looked at a number of things. Um, I think we've had evolving theories. Um, you know, the I would say the the expert analysis that we have that I that I have to point to is the TAT. You know that was an independent group um, from from the different national labs that looked at it in a lot more detail and probably have a lot better of understanding uh, of it than I do. And you know fundamentally they came down with it was a it was a chemical reaction within a drum caused by incompatible materials, but. Um, they cannot tell me what was what was um, so so special or unique about that drum, um, as opposed to the other drums. Because, um, um, like I said, if they were all the same, we would have the same uh, the same result. Um, certainly, there were things that we thought um, and still think may have contributed to that. Whether or not the the glove had anything to do with it, um, there's been different theories on that. The tat came up with the conclusion that they felt the glove did not have uh, a substantive role in the reaction. Um, we thought early on that maybe it would have, and, and the reason for that is, is we've seen glove box gloves uh, um, have reactions with in, it, in, a, in a nitric acid environment. So like I said, we've been processing plutonium for, for decades and decades, um, particularly through the Cold War, and I know we've had documented um, instances where glove box gloves have reacted and have had ex exothermic reactions. So that's one of the theories as to why maybe the glove paid or played a role in it. Um, we've had reactions at Mound and Rocky Flats and some of the other sites. Um, 
and um, we thought maybe the pH, certainly pH, we know um, highly acidic environments play a role, um, and we had, um, we know that um, uh, that that drum in particular had, had an acidic environment, had a low pH. So I would say it's probably a risk spectrum. Um, um, but, um, but I don't think we've ever been, nailed down, been able to nail down what was so unique about 68660. Um, I may never, may never nail down that, that, that fundamental um, uniquity. Christine? Christine wants to. Yeah, if, and I'm sorry to interrupt, and you definitely don't need my help. So this is not to correct or even really embellish anything that Dave's saying, but just to put the two questions sort of together. So why is it taking us so long? I think what we need to recognize is that we had a lot of external review and study on this, and we had to wait a bit for the technical assessment team to complete their report, which is being done at the request to help the Accident Investigation Board. And of course, you heard Ted Wyke's very detailed presentation on the AIB Phase Two report a couple months ago, right? Um, so we needed that to conclude before we could really move forward and understand. But we, beyond just what we learned about our waste at Los Alamos, we also learned that some of our safety analyses related to how um, packages would hold their integrity under certain conditions, um, the AIB illuminated us complex-wide, and that led to some, some safety directives, um, we call them OE, their operational experiences that get issued complex-wide that force us to reevaluate our safety documentation that supports our activities. And so part of what's taking so long is the very methodical way of planning what the safety envelope is for us to do something like the supplemental cooling he showed, to move drums around even within the, the, the domes around Area G. I mean, we, we led to a stand down of basically any significant operations in Area G, not just about these nitrate salts, but, but, but area wide because of this new safety information that came out of the Accident Investigation Board. So there's just a tremendous amount of engineering and nuclear safety documentation and study that has to be done to support our incremental um, set of progress and activities to that, we've, that we're laying out and working with our regulator to get permitted. So there's a whole permitting and regulatory step. And, and to be honest with you, now is the time for us to be very conservative about schedule and not over uh, commit because we, we, we most certainly must not put cost and schedule considerations ahead of safety. So we're not going to do any sort of significant true waste processing at Los Alamos. And this isn't me, just me from a, a site manager perspective, but when I'm back at headquarters and Lannels in my portfolio, we just can't let it happen until we're absolutely certain we're ready and fully understand things. So getting back to the point about is the waste unique, I, I agree with what Dave said. I mean, I think 68660 had something very unique about it. But since we have revealed through the Accident Investigation Board in our own self-review that our records were imprecise about exactly what was in every container and exactly how much incompatible material is in each of these drums, we just have to proceed and approach each with an abundance of caution as though they could present the same risk even though we don't think they're just like the, the breached container. And so just putting that uncertainty back into the factor of this safety work we have to do, it just takes time and it's not in EMLA's ability to approve, it's not even in NALA's ability to approve. We've got headquarters safety offices, the defense board, NMED and others all helping us figure out what the right answer is. and that. Unfortunately, it just takes time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, and this is just a little cartoon. Uh, basically, talks through some of those processes, and I'll I'll give you, you know, kind of a where we're at um, as well. So. So we, as as recognized, we need to treat this these nitrate salts. Um, and and we are in the process of doing an options assessment. So looking at, there's, there's a myriad of ways to, uh, to treat this waste. And we want to be very methodical, um, like Christine mentioned, in, in, in our evaluation to make sure we do it once, we, we do it correctly, and, um, and it's something that, um, that will withstand the scrutiny um, um, of any oversight bodies and our peers. Um, as an example, um, We've done um, a peer review, a uh, start of a peer review, and so we took a lot of uh, national lab um, folks from other national labs have come in and looked at um, early drafts of this options assessment uh, uh, report. 
Um, we had a, um, a lands commission, what they call a, a POFMER. It's another acronym. It's a Parent Organizational Functional Management Review. Um, and uh, they were out last week looking at this, this options assessment, um, looking at the, the different um, techniques and processes uh, that the site's looking at. Um, we're going to have an independent review. Um, Randy and I were talking about that on the drive up here. Um, in fact, that just got kicked off, as I understand it. Um, New Mexico Tech, um, um, NMED has actually commissioned a, uh, an independent look at it as well. So uh, Dr. Romero from New Mexico Tech is up, and we're briefing him and bringing him up to speed on on the different techniques and approaches that we're looking at to treat this, uh, this nitrate wall salt waste stream. So we're walking through this, like I said, in a very methodical process um, with a lot of external review um, to be sure, um, to be sure of, of what we're doing, that it's going to be effective and, um, and it will uh, we'll, we'll, um, render this, uh, this waste stream <coughs> Uh, in a much safer condition. And this is just the process. Uh, goes into a little more detail. Um, we've commissioned a team. Um, so the team, this is an internal team that has put together this options assessment. Um, and this kind of just kind of walks you through the process um, where we've gone through. We've looked at the different options. Uh, we've got, you know, a multidisciplinary team of experts from the lab. Um, um, and, and led, by, uh, uh, led by one of Randy's um, staff members, uh, Bruce Robinson. And, um, and they're walking through that, um, through that process to look at, uh, at the different technologies and the different processes that we, uh, that we might use. And we'll come out of that with a recommendation that's been, I would say, externally reviewed by, by um, several different independent groups. Um, and then that's the, the process that we're going to propose to move forward with. Um, I'm not going to go into this at length in terms of the um, Accident Investigation Board report, but um, um, instead I'm going to talk about where we're at. So um, there was 22 judgments of needs um, that came out of the Accident Investigation Board report, and um, that has driven corrective action plans, um, actually three corrective action plans at Los Alamos. Um, one for the EM uh, DOE field office, one for the NMSA field office, uh, one for the contractor organization lands, um, and then we have um, corrective action plans coming out of Carlsbad headquarters and also of the uh, contractor um, um, counterbot at Carlsbad uh, Nuclear Waste Partnership. So um, this is part of the reason it's taken so long, um, <laughs> actually. Um, so as a result of the AIB report, it found efficiencies um, within our operation. Um, and, and, and we are putting together corrective action plans to address, address that. Um, and like I said, we've got, we've got a couple. Um, we've got two federal corrective action plans um, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've had probably at least half a dozen different conference calls uh, with headquarters counterparts that are reviewing these, uh, our corrective actions to make sure that they are um, in line and, and responsive to the, to the judgment and needs. Um, we are embarking on that same process with the land's corrective actions. We've reviewed them internally. Uh, we're getting headquarters involvement and feedback on that. And, um, and, and, and those are being worked. Those will be uh, ultimately approved and then um, and then it's a matter of, uh, of, of working through those. And it's just a little insight um, into how we, how we organize the Johns. And if you look at the Lands Corrective Action Plan, you'd think it would start in a numerical fashion, start with you know, the first John. Um, but they kind of organize this based on looking at, at, at uh, different, different buckets and um, the first bucket is, is addressing some uh, what we call systemic issues. And as an example there would be, we had a procedure that was incorrect. And how did we allow that procedure to be incorrect? 
Um, and, and so how are we going to improve that process in the future so that we have the right people reviewing, uh, reviewing those procedures to ensure that, uh, uh, that, they're, that they're proper and correct. Um, Carlos, did you have a question? I do. Sure. Um, before I guess you get uh, further into the presentation, um, what, it, it seems to me that there are WIP employees along the line of uh, packing in Los Alamos before it gets put on the truck uh, and shipped down to WIP. Um, hook, and so I, it doesn't seem to me that Los Alamos is, is totally to blame for what happened. Um, but what sort of quality controls have been put in place or will be put in place to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again? You're, you're absolutely right in your observation. Um, these drums are all certified, right? That certification is not done in-house. It's done by, um, 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 by people deployed um, from Carlsbad, if you will, from the Central Characterization um, Project and Program. So yeah, if you look at, the, if you look at that uh, Phase 2 AIB report, there was a lot of um, fault or blame, whatever you want to call it, um, um, areas that need to be improved. And um, you know, there was 40, I want to say 41 Johns, if I got it straight, um, in the AIB report, and 22 of them fell either within the federal lap at, at Los Alamos or within the contractor. So you're absolutely right. There is a number of, 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 um, of Johns that go into, um, into the characterization process. So I would say the fundamental weakness with that characterization process is it was looking, uh, it didn't look far enough upstream. So in the future, what you're going to see from that certification process is a broader look at what we're doing to the waste before it gets in the drum. And, um, and so I hope that answers your question, Carlos. Yeah, so there are, so there are, there are corrective actions uh, that, are under, that are underway to improve the, uh, the certification process. Dave, on these corrective action plans, yes. do you see those being uh, issued before the end of the year? Yes. Okay. And, uh, yeah. so that Imminent, I would say imminently, um, um, yeah, memos are, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, working through, it's working through the bureaucracy as we speak. I would say the, the, um, they are set and we're working to them right now um, in terms of um, we, don't, we are not anticipating major um, technical changes, um, at least, um, yeah, so, um, so those, are, those are imminent. And I guess we can expect a presentation on some of those plans. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a great follow-up. Yeah. officer, somebody from yep. uh, EM, that would be appreciated. Okay. Thank you. So Lee said I'm already running five minutes late, so I'm gonna um, um, kind of um, try to streamline some of this. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this. Um, uh, the second bucket was improving the requirements definition. So we had, a, we had some requirements, and those obviously didn't make their way down into the procedures. So we had RICRA deficiencies, which were, are, are well known. Even the requirement that came from the difficult waste team, I often call that a stealth requirement because uh, what, am I, what I mean by that is um, we knew the recipe uh, that we were supposed to follow and we failed in implementing that at the, at the ground level procedures at the lab. Um, and part of the problem with that is that was not a well understood requirement. And so um, that bucket of Johns looked, looks at um, making sure we understand what the requirements are. Um, the third bucket's actually implementing those improvements and then the final loop around on that is how do you know uh, the things you did up front? So it's looking at um, compliance, both internal assessment and external assessment. So a lot of the oversight johns that, that DOE has are in that final bucket, and um, um, as well as the uh, contractor assurance system that, uh, that the lab um, uses to uh, uh, ensure that it's implementing its requirements. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is, um, this was just a slide, um, um, and I think the main message I want to say there is, is kind of, um, I recognize this is a volunteer board, 
I appreciate, we appreciate um, the recommendations that we received from the board. Um, I think you had a voice in, um, in the principles uh, settlement, the principles of the, of the settlement uh, agreement um, in terms of um, voicing your opinion uh, in support of uh, the supplemental environmental projects that were laid out within that, um, uh, within that principles agreement. So um, I just want to, I, th I think that's where, that was one example of, of, uh, of my opinion where you had, uh, had some impact. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time. I think Christine may yeah, okay. hit on on transition updates. So I am going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that slide and um, round it out if there's any questions. I'm sorry. Could you could Mr. you identify yourself, please? Mr. I'm sorry. Chair, can you have him come up to the mic and introduce himself? Yeah, I was just going to. Uh, the question I want to ask uh, the the drum that exploded um, is it is it a drum like you show on the graphic on page seven or a container like uh, on page four? It was a drum, so it's not like the picture. So what you're seeing in this picture, that's called a standard waste box. So what you saw, um, the drum that um, had the exothermic reaction, and there's not a picture in the presentation of the, uh, of the whip drum. So the drum that had, had the exothermic reaction, it was a 55-gallon drum, um, and, and the, uh, the lid lifted and allowed the, uh, the radioactive material to be released. So it is not the same as what you're seeing in that picture. But it is like the cartoon on page seven in that graphic. That's what he was looking at. Oh, okay. At. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions of Dave at this point? Uh, you know, these corrective action plans, certainly they're very important. And I would hopefully, you know, expect a kind of a presentation to the board on some of these because we'd like to see what specifically is going to take place, you know, with regards to EM and also the lab about how they're going to, you know, basically straighten out the process. Okay. Sure. Okay. That'd be a and good that topic. Be and any, and, and if there's any other kind of testing that was going to, is going to be done, that would, that would be something I'd like to see. Okay. Yeah, we could get into more detail on that okay. about how we're yeah. going to uh, prove the process. Um, in terms of like, testing like and sampling. Specific and, testing yes. you're probably going to do. That would, that would be important. Any other So just question? quickly, Mr. Chair, um, kind of as an example I ran into the other day to support uh, Dave here is um, the cooling unit that we put in that is a train unit, you know, the same thing you see on TV, the same thing they have on your house. It's built by train that's air conditioning, HVAC company. Uh, when we originally looked at that and they prepared it, uh, we noted it did not meet the laboratory's uh, electrical standards, believe it or not. And so we uh, had a delay in that project. We had to send, or the unit was still at train when we inspected it. We had the, the company train completely rewire it to our electric code. Uh, because it was being attached to a nuclear facility. So that's the level of rigor. So it, a lot of times it seems, and I appreciate Mr. Smelling's comment, um, you know, two steps forward, one step back, but this is very a very slow, methodical process, so it's done absolutely correctly this time. Thank you, Lee. Um, well, public comment period. I was going to say, we're due for a break, and I wondered if you could wait to the public comment period, which we'll have right after, you know, at uh, 445 for additional questions, if that would be agreeable. I know it takes a while, but we're getting behind in our agenda. Uh, we'd like to do that if, that, if that's agreeable. And Dave loves yes. questions yes. during the uh, break. Can you have two minutes now to, d to address what? Supplemental cooling. Supplemental cooling? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and just. Um, what is your 
Please go to the mic, please, and identify yourself. I'm Mary Whiteman. My question is, I understand that I just heard it was electrical, the, the energy for the supplemental cooling, and where does that come from? So the, uh, the electrical power for that comes from the electrical grid. Um, so it's, um, it's, fed in, it's fed in through, uh, through a series of breakers and through a series of transformers to, uh, to Area G and to 375. Is there a backup generator or something similar in case of some severance of the source? So we, we um, there is no, there is not a backup generator. There is multiple feeds into Area G, so it's not reliant on any one single um, feed, if you will. So there are multiple uh, feeds into Area G, so it's not reliant on on any single. Um, um, power source, but there is not a, a backup generator for the supplemental cooling. And those lines all come from Farmington or somewhere like that? Like one line comes and then they branch out? I, um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I, would, I, I do not know that. Thank you. You bet.